This week on Vaticano, Pope Francis closes the holy door at St. Peter's Basilica, marking the end of the Jubilee Year of Mercy. We take you to the consistory of the Sacred College of Cardinals. This year, Pope Francis elevates 17 new candidates to the rank of Cardinal. And learn with us how the great masterpieces of Italian sculptor Giovan Lorenzo Bernini were born. For this and more, Vaticano starts now. O Holy Father, holy and omnipotent in love, who in your Son Jesus, born of the Virgin Mary, have manifested the face of your infinite mercy, look with kindness on the Church gathered in prayer at the conclusion of the Jubilee year, aware of the gifts of grace received and encouraged to witness in words and in works the tenderness of your merciful love, we close the holy door. With this prayer, Pope Francis closed the holy door of St. Peter's Basilica on November the 20th, the Solemnity of Christ the King. This gesture marked the official end of the Jubilee Year of Mercy. More than 21 million pilgrims passed through the Holy Door in Rome, opened by the Pope on December the 8th, 2015, the Feast of the Immaculate Conception. In fact, the first Holy Door was opened in the Cathedral of Bangui, Central African Republic, on November the 29th, 2015, during the apostolic visit of the Holy Father to that country. After the ceremony of the closing of the Holy Door, Pope Francis proceeded to celebrate a solemn Mass for some 70,000 faithful gathered in St. Peter's Square for the occasion. Let us ask for the gift of this open and living memory. Let us ask for the grace of never closing the doors of reconciliation and pardon but rather of knowing how to go beyond evil and differences, opening every possible pathway of hope. As God believes in us, infinitely beyond any merits we have, so too we are called to instill hope and provide opportunities to others. Because even if the holy door closes, the true door of mercy, which is the heart of Christ, always remains open wide for us. From the lacerated side of the risen one until the very end of time, flow mercy, consolation, and hope. Reflecting on the passage from the Gospel of Luke on the scene of Christ on the cross, Pope Francis said that this moment is a manifestation of Jesus' kingship. His kingship is paradoxical. His throne is the cross. His crown is made of thorns. He has no scepter but a reed is put into his hand. He does not have luxurious clothing, but is stripped of his tunic. He wears no flashy rings on his fingers, but his hands are pierced with nails. He has no treasure, but instead is sold for 30 pieces of silver. Pope Francis explained that the reign of Jesus is not of this world. And so our King went to the ends of the universe in order to embrace and save every living being. 
He did not condemn us, nor did he conquer us, and he never disregarded our freedom. But he paved the way with a humble love that forgives all things, hopes all things, sustains all things. This love alone overcame and continues to overcome our worst enemy, sin, death, fear. At the end of the celebration, Pope Francis signed his new apostolic letter, Misericordia et Misera, which means mercy with misery, in which he invites the Church to continue living mercy with the same intensity experienced during this extraordinary jubilee. In a gesture to consign the document to all the people of God, the Holy Father handed a copy to people from different countries and paths of life, including Cardinal Antonio Tagli of Manila, Philippines, Archbishop Leo William Cushley of St. Andrews in Edinburgh, Scotland, two priests from the Democratic Republic of the Congo and Brazil who served as missionaries of mercy during the Jubilee, a permanent deacon from the Diocese of Rome together with his family, two religious sisters from Mexico and South Korea, a family, children, parents and grandparents from the United States, a young engaged couple, two mothers, one sick person and one with disabilities. The Jubilee Year of Mercy thus came to an end, bringing many spiritual fruits to participants. Pope Francis wanted this Jubilee to be celebrated mostly at a local level all over the world. The Vatican estimates that more than 12,000 holy doors were opened during the Jubilee Year across the world. So many pilgrims have crossed the threshold of the holy doors and far away from the clamor of the daily news, they have tasted the great goodness of the Lord. We give thanks for this as we recall how we have received mercy in order to be merciful, in order that we too may become instruments of mercy. Undoubtedly, this year of mercy has been an enriching year. Besides the spiritual activities in Rome, there was World Youth Day in Krakow and the canonizations of numerous saints, including Mother Teresa. Unless the Pope calls another special jubilee, the next scheduled holy year will take place in 2025. In a few moments, we'll be back with more on Vaticano. More on Vaticano begins now. Caro fratello neo cardinale. My dear brothers, newly created cardinals, the journey towards heaven begins in the plains, in a daily life broken and shared, spent and given, in the quiet daily gifts of all that we are. Our mountaintop is this quality of love. Our goal and aspiration is to strive on life's plane, together with the people of God, to become persons capable of forgiveness and reconciliation. 
On the 19th of November, Pope Francis presided over a special ceremony for the creation of new cardinals. A consistory took place in St. Peter's Basilica on the eve of the close of the Jubilee of Mercy. The 17 newly appointed cardinals are from six continents and include three U.S. archbishops. And for the first time in history, men from the Central African Republic, Mauritius and Bangladesh. Pope Francis reflected on a passage from the Gospel when Jesus, after choosing the Twelve Apostles, did not stay up on the mountain, but descended to be close to the people. This call is accompanied by four commands or exhortations, which the Lord gives as a way of molding the Apostles' vocation through real, everyday situations. They are four actions that will shape embody and make tangible the path of discipleship. We could say that they represent four stages of a mystagogy of mercy, love, do good, bless, and pray. Fate il bene, benedite, pregate. After the homily, dressed in their red robes, the future cardinals professed the creed and then approached Pope Francis one by one. The Pope gave each of them the red biretta, the cardinal's ring, and assigned each of them a church in Rome. Laudem omnipotentis Dei et apostolice sedis ornamentum. To the glory of Almighty God and the honor of the Apostolic See, receive the scarlet beretta as a sign of the dignity of the cardinalate, signifying your readiness to act with courage, even to the shedding of your blood, for the increase of the Christian faith, for the peace and tranquility of the people of God, and for the freedom and growth of the Holy Roman Church. Among the new cardinals was Father Ernest Simoni from Albania. This Albanian priest is 86 years old and spent about 30 years in labor camps under the communist regime, but never gave up the celebration of Mass. Today, each of you, dear brothers, is asked to cherish in your own heart and in the heart of the Church this summons to be merciful like the Father, and to realize that, if something should rightly disturb us and trouble our consciences, it is the fact that so many of our brothers and sisters are living without the strength, light, and consolation born of friendship with Jesus Christ, without a community of faith to support them, without meaning and a goal in life. Senza un orizzonte di senso di vita. After this solemn celebration, Pope Francis and the Sacred College of Cardinals went to meet Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI. <laughs> because the cardinals must be part of the Diocese of Rome, whose bishop and primate is the Pope, the dedication of their titular church in Rome is an important act. This means cardinals are always linked to Rome, though they may come from different countries. The College of Cardinals reflects how the Synod of the Diocese of Rome evolved to become a governmental body. It is an institution that can be considered basically as the Pope's Senate. Edward Penton, a correspondent of EWTN's National Catholic Register in Rome, says that by choosing these particular bishops to elevate to the rank of Cardinal, 
Pope Francis put an emphasis on the pastoral element. He wants those in the College of Cardinals to bring that experience to the college um, and in many ways reflect his own vision for the church, his own vision for, as, as he would say, bringing out the church to engage more with society. And I think that's what all of these cardinals, or at least the large majority of them, have in common, um, particularly in the West, uh, the United States, for example, and also in Europe. The newly elected Cardinal Diodone Nudzapalainga from the Central African Republic is known for his efforts to end the three-year conflict between the Muslim Selika rebel coalition and the mostly Christian militia known as Anti-Balaka, in which some 6,000 people have been killed. Today is the day of joy for me and for our people. The Imam and the President of the Republic were there, and the President of the Assembly and the Ministers of the Central African Republic came to be with me on this historical day. The Pope came to the Central African Republic and opened the first holy door. And today, for the first time, the Pope called and made it possible for the Central African Republic to be a part of the College of Cardinals. The new cardinal from Venezuela, Baltasar Porras Cardoso, told EWTN about the meeting that the new cardinals had with Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI after the consistory. He said that Benedict is praying a lot for Venezuela. The meeting with him was very beautiful and cordial. It was a simple gesture by the cardinals to spend a moment in the chapel of the monastery where the Pope Emeritus resides. He has trouble getting around by himself, but he's very clear-headed, and he talked with each one of us. This is the third consistory called for by Pope Francis. Now the Sacred College of Cardinals consists of 228 cardinals, of whom 121 with voting rights for a new pope. Robert Royal is a Catholic author and the president of the Faith and Reason Institute based in Washington, D.C. He shared his thoughts on what effect the further internationalization of the Cardinals College might have on it. I don't think it's a great change, I keep telling people in the United States, not to regard this not to make too much of these changes, but also not to make too little of them. There's, it's clear that the Holy Father wants to bring in more cardinals from what he's often referred to as the peripheries, which is to say the countries that are not often represented in the Vatican by um, uh, churchmen at the cardinals level. So you'll see in this group lots from a Africa and Asia, some Latin Americans, some Europeans, and, and a few Americans. Um, I think it's just an, an attempt to make the, the church here in the Vatican uh, look more like the global church, which is a global church. In his three-year pontificate, Pope Francis has created 55 new cardinals, including those from November the 19th, of whom 44 are eligible to participate in a conclave. Thanks for watching. Stick around for more on Vaticano. Welcome back. You're watching Vaticano. Giovanni Lorenzo Bernini is one of the greatest sculptors and architects of the Renaissance. He decorated and also designed many churches and squares in Rome. The Colonnade of St. Peter's Square, the Fountain of the Four Rivers in Piazza Navona, the Throne of St. Peter, and the Chapel of the Blessed Sacrament are just some of the examples of Bernini's great works. On November the 17th, the Vatican Museums unveiled a new aspect of this Italian artist with the initiative Bernini and his models. The exhibition comprises seven preparatory models for future important artworks. Alice Baltera is an art restorer and she knows these models very well. She's been working with them for seven years. We 
questi modelli che voi vedrete sono i modelli These models that you see here are the models before fusion. So they are the original models before being bronze cast. They represent something really special because the original models in the past were usually destroyed. Generalmente in passato veniva distrutto. The models were used for the casting of some bronze figures in the throne of St. Peter, among which the heads of St. Athanasius, St. John Chrysostom, and some figures of angels. The altar of the throne is a big monument in marble, stucco, and gilt bronze, adorning the apse of St. Peter's Basilica. It was built by Giovanni Lorenzo Bernini and his workshop between 1656 and 1666. The purpose of these bronze sculptures is to guard the venerated relic of the wooden and ivory throne on which, according to medieval tradition, St. Peter sat to preach to the early Christians. Bernini's models show how hard he worked on this project, which lasted 10 years and which he changed several times over the period. Indeed, the angels have different sizes and reveal the two stages of his work. Il valore aggiunto a questa opera è sicuramente trovare le tracce. The additional value of these works is certainly the discovery of the true marks of the artists and his collaborators, their fingerprints, the signs left by their hands working the day. Because some parts were missing or had to come off, we were able to observe the underlying layer that the artist probably modified when rethinking his work. This allows us to study the artwork from the point of view of the techniques used. For instance, we can see the iron reinforcement in all the different layers down to the final stratum. As for the materials used, we can carry out some scientific investigation there as well. We found, for example, vegetal species and fibers in the arms of the angel of the Most Blessed Sacrament. All this can be seen by the visitors. Nel braccio dell'angelo del Santissimo Sacramento si può vedere. The final polished surface is the result of the spreading of a thin layer of fine clay painted with clay water over the various strata, which produces considerable volume and thickness. This is the altar of the Blessed Sacrament, situated on the right side of St. Peter's Basilica. In 1629, Pope Urban VIII Barberini commissioned Bernini to build this altar, and the master completed the altar and a tabernacle, flanked by two kneeling angels, after only 45 years, in 1674, under Pope Clement X Altieri. This is one of the models for these angels, which has survived. These here have been preserved because of a decision made in the early 18th century. For sure, the undergoing fusion, these forms must have been damaged. In spite of this, it was decided to preserve them as examples for the artists of the early 18th century. So a sort of fine arts academy was created here at the museums, located where the Etruscan Museum is now, with a big gallery where these models and many other things were at the disposal of the artists that worked here. It is for this reason that they were preserved, otherwise we would have lost them. The exhibited statuettes originated in the collection that Cardinal Flavio Chigi I, grandson of Pope Alexander VII, had gathered in Rome at his home from the early 1660s. So che venivano comunque realizzati anche per proporre They were created to propose a work of art to the demander. Often what happened is that they were so beautiful and charming that they were baked and then stored and sold. The difference with the other objects is that these are made out of baked clay ceramic. Sono comunque in argilla cotta, ceramica. The dust and dirt deposits that have grayed several areas over time were removed through special erasers of different texture and composition. The restorers also eliminated the traces of earlier restoration interventions. In order to conserve these works of art, the restoration team invented a new solution, never used before. A mixture that we have formulated and is essentially made of cellulose paper with a solvent that can be removed at any time without pulling the original material, doesn't stain, is light and easy to work with. It is also non-toxic and this is very important for the operator. So we are happy with the solution. Flavia Calori di Vignale, 
and the person in charge of organizing all the process of restoration says that the latter always entails teamwork. To complete the restoration, they had to elaborate with chemists, photographers, and restorers from different departments. They are made of earth and straw, of almost nothing. Paper mache is more resistant. So placing your hands on such fragile material and by such an important artist is surely very exciting for the restorer, but also very hard, and it requires a lot of attention. The restorer, as you can see, is very excited. For seven years, she's been carrying this big responsibility to take care of a material that is very fragile by an extremely important artist. This restoration has allowed me to grow a lot. From the professional point of view, it was a challenge because it's very hard to come across this kind of material. I'm really very lucky compared to a lot of other colleagues because being able to work on these materials is really rare. I'm glad I had this experience, even if it was not simple. From the 16th of November to the 17th of February next year, Visitors to the Vatican Museums will be able to appreciate this new exhibition, which illustrates how Bernini's masterpieces were born. <laughs>